All right, so uh, this, we didn't end up getting to fisheries last time. So um, this lecture is gonna kind of be a blend of, um, of two lectures here. Um, so uh, this is kind of um, a combination of uh, renewable, renewables um, part, I don't know what part we're, we're up to right now, I think. Uh, that was part four before. So this is kind of like renewables part five and uh, market-based policy part one. And the, um, any announcements? So uh, I guess things I wanted to mention, uh, there, oh, the course evaluations, by the way, I forgot to mention this last time, they are available. Um, I think that the university course evaluations are, are open until the 4th, December 4th. Um, it's a little confusing. I also teach an engineering course and there they use a different evaluation system, which I think closes uh, early, like at November 29th. And so I always forget which one closes when because they're always different, but, uh, but they are available. And if you uh, would like to submit a course evaluation for this course, which is always appreciated, that, um, so you always get to get that feedback there. It's in the top left corner of Canvas. I've put a link in the menu bar that says course evaluation. You can also find that link in the course information module. Uh, within Canvas. And so you should be able to find those links there. And I think you should have also gotten an email about your course evaluations. So those are out and available. And um, of course, that would be appreciated. Um, there is the, the, you just turned in that homework D2. Um, I hope that was, <clears throat> I got some comments from people that they uh, felt that that was a helpful homework uh, that, that helped to solidify some things for them. And I was glad to hear that. Um, which um, it, it actually made me a little bit sad because uh, I said, well, then for the next time I teach this, I have to come up with a new homework. And, um, and, and so, you know, it, it will be, uh, it, it's, it, it, not, the solution set will be out there. And so I'll have to come up with something that is, that is, I think, similar, but different. And so I, I tried a very different format for this homework than what I did last semester. And so I'm glad that it worked, but I'm also sort of sad that I, it's gonna be hard for me to come up with a unique version that's sort of similar. Um, but uh, but um, I am going to release, um, hopefully today, homework D7, which I'm not gonna make as quite as long, but it'll still be worth 100 points. That'll be just about fisheries. And I did that because I promised an additional homework to help people take advantage of that one drop homework. Um, and then I also want to have you uh, have a little bit of practice with the fishery stuff that we will talk about today. And I think that's it. So basically there's this lecture, there's Tuesday's lecture, then there's Thanksgiving break, no lecture. Um, and then uh, I think we've reserved Tuesday of the finals week for, or the, the last week of class. So the, um, not the original finals week, but what's kind of the new finals week as a review day. And so we can review anything that you'd like to review before the final exam. Then the final exam will be on Thursday of that week. Um, that's the 80% of your final exam comes from the individual version. And then 20% comes from that collaborative open book version on Friday. And if Thursday and Friday are too busy for you, you can go on to Canvas and you can go into people and then under groups and you can elect to be in the later group and then it'll be the Monday and Tuesday of the original finals week where Monday is the individual version, 80% of your score and then Tuesday is the group or open book version, 20% um, of your score. Uh, but make your elections before December 1st because on December 1st, I'll turn the groups into Canvas sections which will allow me to um, to give the section that's later, the, uh, the, the later exam assignment and the section that's earlier, the earlier exam assignment, so that um, everybody's blocked off on the, uh, the right times and the due dates show up on the right times. So make all of your selections before December 1st, um, and you just do that again, people and then groups. So before we dive, so to speak, right back into the fisheries, are there any questions about the layout of things going forward? Only a couple more classes left. Pretty clear. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we have been 
we just introduced the uh, economics of fisheries, another type of natural asset um, that has a very different type of dynamic. And so the idea here is that you have X fish in a fishery and under ideal scenarios, then they produce our offspring uh, per fish, say per year. So per unit time, but I'll just say per year to be useful or, or um, to be um, simple. And then, uh, and then the fishery has a carrying capacity K which is the uh, max fish um, possible in the fishery. And it's, you know, where there's food limitations. Yeah, we'll primarily focus on like, you know, based on the food and nutrient limitations in the fishery, it is just not possible to uh, have more than K um, uh, fish in a fishery. And that induces a probability of survival. So you could say there's a probability of offspring survival which looks like um, <clears throat> k minus x over k, which is equal to just saying one minus x over k, um, where basically you're saying as you run out of space for new offspring, then you can view the offspring that is produced not being able to find enough food. Uh, or if you'd like um, to think you can view the parent fish not being able to find enough food just to even bring the offspring um, uh, to that point to, to hatch out. So um, so either way, you can view it as a probability of survival to reproduction. So you could view this as, as, you know, instead of just survival, you could say survival to reproduction. Maybe I'll add that there, to reproduction. And so what that means is that the fish produced per year is going to be um, X, the number of fish, times R, the number of offspring that they produce, times this probability, one minus X divided by K. And so, um, and so this is the total fish produced per year, where this portion here is the per capita reproduction rate. So every year you're adding this quantity to the total population. And that comes from every fish in the current population generating this much. So if you like to think of this like a bank, then you can view this kind of as um, the money in the bank. And you can view this over here as an interest rate that uh, changes with bank balance. So it's like this bank that says that um, we are happy to allow your money to grow um, very fast, but we are eventually going to throttle it down so that you can't actually have an account with more than a certain amount of money in it. So you put $5 in and it quickly will become 500, but then once it's at 500, you don't get any other interest from then on out. And you can't even put any more money in that. So that's kind of the, the type of bank that we're dealing with that we're figuring out how to manage. And so when you were managing such a bank, you would want to capitalize on taking your money out before it reaches that $500 limit and then allow it to continue to grow. 
So you constantly take $100 out every year so that you sit more at say $400. And at that $400, it'll constantly then produce the $100 that you'll need to take out the next year. And so that's what we're trying to figure out is how much money do we leave in the bank? Um, and so, you know, how big of a harvest do we, do we need to have? And so the, um, and so if we were to, to view an unharvested fishery over time, so this is time, um, then it would grow uh, somewhat like this, where you have a slow initial growth, it rises up, uh, then it slows down again, and then it levels out. And it stays at that level forever. So this is our unharvested fishery. And this uh, is S-shaped. And so the fancy term for that is sigmoidal. And it is a common uh, growth pattern. And this particular growth pattern that's driven by this particular model of the fishery um, is referred to as logistic growth. As I'm sure most of you have heard before in some of your other classes, especially those of you who are sustainability students, probably been beat over the head with this stuff. And, um, and so this level here is our carrying capacity K. And uh, so it's, again, it's like you put in some initial deposit in the bank, um, it grows slowly, and then it starts to grow very quickly. So very high interest rate, but then the interest rate gets backed off until eventually it goes to zero. And so you get zero growth out here. And in normal populations, you don't actually want to live in a world where you are at carrying capacity, because that means that um, basically every offspring is fighting for food, is waiting for a parent to die in order for that offspring to survive, to get that parent's food. Um, there's disease. Um, it is not a happy time in an ecosystem when a population is at carrying capacity. Um, and so typically in populations, you've got these multiple trophic levels interacting with each other. So you've got predators which are preying on things, and that is going to prevent things from actually rising up to that carrying capacity. And so um, you will end up getting a different um, steady state value. And I guess that's another term that I want to introduce here is that this, maybe I'll use a different color. This, this value here is the steady state value. Uh, or we can view it as the equilibrium value, but I'm going to use probably the term steady state as to not confuse things with our market equilibrium. And we refer to this other portion uh, over here um, as the transient. And, um, and so this transient, once it so-called dies out, then it gives way to the steady state behavior. In forestry dynamics, we were sort of focused on the transients. We were very interested in, we never let the forest reach some steady state because forests eventually go into decline. And so we um, are constantly you know, harvesting them and, um, and we kind of introduce a new steady state which comes from the average kind of wood, you know, it's like I mentioned that you have multiple stands. And so you're harvesting stands at different times, but each stand only gets a certain rotation length to grow. And so the average um, forest is, um, is kind of averaged across the stands. And that kind of becomes what we mean by a steady state where we are kind of the, the predators that are coming in and regulating the forest population. So the forest population reaches some sort of steady state, but it's this, but there are these kind of hard things where the whole stand is, we don't, um, we don't um, in fisheries, we don't harvest all of the fish. And so like in a forestry, we, we let a stand grow and then we harvest everything and then let it grow again, and harvest everything and let it grow again. In a fishery, we are going to let it grow to a point where we harvest a little, 
so that we can come into balance, a new balance. And so this a new balance will be a new steady state. And so the idea is that uh, we, the people in a harvested fishery, which I'll draw down here, And so this is our harvested fishery. Then we have, and this, I guess I should have wrote up here, this is um, fish population. And this is fish population. And so we still have this carrying capacity that we start at. I'll draw it um, here. <clears throat> but when we start harvesting, we pull fish out. We pull um, a small number of fish out to the point where we can come into balance with those fish again. And so um, that what that ends up looking like is a trajectory that's something like this where this is when we start harvesting and we continue harvesting from then on out. And this portion over here, this is our steady state with harvesting. And I mentioned that we come into balance here. And basically what we're saying is that in this, so in this steady state up here, F of X, where F is our regeneration rate is equal to zero. Down here, F of X is equal to the harvest rate. And so um, we, are coming into balance and in that we are harvesting enough fish that the fish are able to repopulate at exactly the rate that we're taking fish out of the fishery. And that allows things to come into a, um, a steady state that, you know, a new steady state here. So there's still transients over here. And so these are transients that die out, but we are focused on the steady state analysis that's over here. And so long as, and what is sustainability? Um, sustainability equals is when the steady state population is greater than zero. And so there are going to be other cases where poor choices in harvesting will cause the fish population to go extinct. And so they do reach a steady state, but the steady state is no fish. And, and the only other way to get fish back is to then reseed them and wait for potentially a long time. So by, by harvesting a little bit, uh, we can count on the yearly regeneration rate to keep up with um, our harvest and establish a new steady state. If we harvest all of the fish, it will take them a very long time to come back up. And it will be um, so long that, um, so fish are a market that need to be eaten kind of immediately. Um, whereas wood, you know, like, um, you know, we, we use timber to build things that are durable, that live for long amounts of time. And so, um, you know, being able to reseed a fishery and have it grow back up. We don't actually, because of ecological factors, we're not even that good at, you know, ensuring if you put four, you know, fish into a fishery, um, how do we know that in 10 years, we're gonna have, you know, 4,000 fish in that fishery or 400 fish in that fishery or, or the original four, or those four, maybe they're gonna go extinct. And because other things can happen to the fishery, ecological problems, you can get algae blooms that make it very difficult for new fish to establish themselves. So we can't manage a fishery wait, like we can a forest. We always have to manage a standing population of fish to keep that a healthy fishery. And so that's why we're interested in this steady state analysis where our steady state is greater than zero. So, um, so just to give a better picture of what 
um, you know, that, so if I were to plot that f of x, so this is my fish population here. Now it's on the horizontal axis. So I've got my carrying capacity here, k. So um, I just counted over one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's going to be, I'm just going to mark the midpoint here. And um, so if I were to draw, and then this here is going to be my f of x, which is uh, fish, new fish per year. And if I were to then draw that, it's going to look like this, reaches a maximum right in the middle, and then it comes down and it hits zero at the carrying capacity. So it looks like something like that, where this here is the This here is the max regeneration rate. And uh, the fish population where that occurs at is called the, um, is, is usually referred to as the, the maximum sustainable yield, which tends to be half of the carrying capacity. So what we view is we, um, the idea here is we harvest this many fish. So um, this is K minus X maximum sustainable yield. And so we harvest this much to maximize um, harvest rate. Uh, but no more. And so there wouldn't be any benefit in harvesting more uh, because the fish regeneration starts to decline. So, um, so what's going on here is like, imagine if you're at a fish population that was right here. So we're saying that we've got this many fish down here and it has a regeneration rate here. So things aren't quite at carrying capacity, which means that you're, you are getting coexistence of parents with offspring. Nobody is fighting to the death just to get that last morsel of whatever these fish are eating. Um, it's getting a little tight, but not that tight. So somebody comes along and they start harvesting more. So another boat is added to the fishery. That increase in harvest will decrease the fish population. So it will decrease a little bit, say going down to here. Now, by decreasing the fish population, you've decreased the competition for food. You've now increased the probability that fish will survive. And so that is going to then move the regeneration rate up. So that was really convenient because I have added an additional boat to add to increase my harvest. And what has happened? The fishery has increased its regeneration rate. So um, this, this here was like, you know, F of X1. And this here is F of X2, which is greater than F of X1. So F of X1 was in equilibrium at the old rate. And F of X2 is in equilibrium at the new rate. And so there is this natural thing that as I increase my harvest rate, the fishery moves right along with it because I'm actually making it easier for fish to survive when I'm in this region. Now, once I hit this point right here, then um, population scarcity effects start to kick in. And so <clears throat> for this point, down here, then as you reduce the number of fish, what you end up doing is you get rid of the, you're not worried about the competitive effects. Effectively, fish aren't competing with each other in this region. And because fish aren't competing with each other in this region, because there's enough food for all of the fish in this region, then if you overfish, so if you, if you just keep fishing, then you're just going to reduce the regeneration rate. 
because here fish are being depressed from the regeneration rate that they would like to, to uh, have. But over here, the depression to regeneration rate from overcrowding is not very large. So if you start fishing in this region, you're just going to reduce the, uh, the uh, regeneration rate. So what can happen, though, is just like a bank account with a large amount of principal, you can tap into your principal and not realize that you're doing it until it's too late. So what can happen is that someone can increase fishing effort um, so that they keep climbing up here and they keep seeing that they're getting more fish. Now, if you increase your fishing effort too far to the point where you go over this, you can, you can be in this situation here where <clears throat> you have now pulled so many fish out that you've now depressed the regeneration rate. The regeneration rate has fallen, but you still think you're getting a more fish out. Every boat you add is still finding more fish, but the fish they're finding aren't the new fish from regeneration. They're the old fish that were regenerating. And so eventually, so you were, you were just going to cause further declines in the population because you're not, it's not replenishing how many fish you've taken out. So at this point, once you've moved over this point right here, even if you don't add boats, the same number of boats that have caused you to push over this point, because they have been taking out more than the fish are putting back in, that's gonna cause even more decline in the fish population. And the further declines in the fish population are going to be a march to a total extinction of fish from the fishery. So that's why it is really important to never biologically overfish. And what we mean by biologically overfish <clears throat> is that you never go over, um, you never deplete the fishery of more than a maximum sustainable yield. So you never go any further than this amount in the fishery. Professor, you question. only fish this much. Yep. Um, it was, it's regarding the F of X1 and F of X2. Did you say that if you get a new rate, does, did you say it doesn't increase the competition or decrease the competition for new rates? Um, the, a larger, I should say a larger harvest rate reduces competition between fish. Okay. All right. Just making sure. Uh-huh. And this is just like, um, you know, just think predator, predators regulating prey population. That's why healthy populations have both predators and prey, because the predators are able to um, reduce the prey population to a point where those prey don't have to be in uh, tight competition with other prey for food. They do have to be vigilant to, so that only the prey that survive are the ones that escape the predators, but the prey that survive are going to be healthy prey that have plenty of access to food and can fight off disease, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's what we mean by biologically overfishing, going over this maximum sustainable yield population. So how do we figure out um, the effort how do we use an economic model, a bioeconomic model? So we need a bioeconomic model to predict fish um, steady state population. Uh, and um, uh, amount of effort uh, expended by fishery. And we are in, there are ways to deal with the, there are ways to deal with the transients in a much more sophisticated analysis of fisheries. And we are not going to do that analysis here. We are going to focus just on, um, so we are going to take the you know, simple for simplicity. So we're going to simplify and we're going to focus on the steady state. Uh, 
And so in the steady state case, then <clears throat> um, I know that the harvest rate, the yield that I get out, so the yield is going to be equal to the um, regeneration. Let's just go back to the dark blue. So um, I need an economic model of yield. And so what I'm going to say, and this is just an assumption, it's a simple model, that um, the yield Y for a given effort E, so this is effort, so as you can think of this as number of boats, we're gonna say that that is equal to um, some, um, well, that is equal to um, some amount of, I'm just deciding the best way to say this um, based on uh, my own notes here. And so the, I've got a certain number of fish in the fishery and there is going to be, um, so for, for every unit of effort, so this is E, so this is my unit of effort. Again, like, you know, boat, every boat is going to go out and come back someday or at the end of the year. So if I put out one unit of effort, so I have one boat in there for the whole year, then I need to figure out how much yield do I get for that year? Well, based on technology, the, you know, the boats have got certain efficiencies. And so, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to model the efficiency of the boat as this model Q times X where X is the um, fish population and Q is just a proportionality constant. Representing the efficiency of uh, the boats. So if I, uh, if as fish become more scarce, the yields are gonna go down because it's just harder to find them. But for every fish that's out there, there, that's basically what I'm gonna say here is for every fish that's out there, there is some probability that the technology used on the boat is gonna be able to find that fish. And so you take all of the fish multiplied by that probability and you find the amount of fish that are going to be able to be harvested by um, a particular boat over a time period, let's say a year. And then we multiply that by the number of boats and then we get our yield. And so uh, this is the yield for a given effort. And so what I would like um, is to be able to plot that yield effort curve. I would like to be able to be able to make a plot where I've got E on one axis and Y on the other axis and to see what that curve looks like. That's my kind of goal here. And so this is the economic side of it. So I said it's bioeconomics. So let's combine the biology side of it and see if we can manage to come up with a yield effort curve. And so I said, if we're only focused on the steady state, then I'm just going to set the yield for a given effort equal to the regeneration rate. So this is the yield or the harvest rate. And this is the regeneration rate. And this is what happens at steady state. And so if I plug those things in, then I get, you know, E Q x is equal to x r one minus uh, x over k. And, uh, and so with a little bit of math, so you can solve for x, 
then I end up getting that x is equal to this expression k minus uh, qk, oh, q, e over r. And that's, you're just not going to go through the math, but you can do all of that in there. And so now that I have an expression for x, I can plug that back into my yield effort expression to eliminate x so that the expression is based entirely on e effort. And what I get is, um, so this is eqx, where x is this thing. And what that ends up giving me when I plug all that in is this other expression, which looks a lot like the logistic growth expression. Um, it definitely is, is closely related. Minus QKE over R, which if I like, um, those of you more mathematically inclined might like to see that expanded out um, to sort of see what shape to expect from that curve. And it would be QKE, where K is the carrying capacity, don't forget, minus Q squared K over R times E squared. And, um, and for those of you kind of more mathematically inclined, um, it's fine if you're not, but you can see that there's this kind of parabola thing that you know is going to be upside down that's going to be shifted up. That's basically what we see here is that this, we imagine that this curve, which I'm going to draw in a second, is going to look like that. It's going to just be uh, an upside down parabola shifted up so that um, the tip of the parabola is up here, which again looks just like the logistic curve, the growth curve, or the, um, the regeneration curve. Now in the book example, they set uh, k equal to 10 and q equal to one and r equal to 10. And if you do that, then you get a yield effort curve that looks like 10e minus e squared. And so there is an expression in the book and that's where it comes from. It just comes from that logistic growth formula um, applied to this bioeconomic uh, assumption of yield equaling region rate at the steady state. And so um, I can also plot the, um, so if I, I will just go to the next one. So my yield effort curve is, and I'll just rewrite that QKE minus Q squared K over R times E squared, which in the books example is 10 E minus E squared. And so you can view this as the net benefit, or not the net benefit, I'm sorry. You can view this as the benefit for E units of effort. And then the cost then of E units of effort is just however much it costs to run those boats uh, times the number of boats. So the cost for E units of effort would just be C times E, where this here is the uh, per boat cost to operate, <clears throat> say per year. And so with those two things, you know, I've got a benefit and a cost, and I can then solve for a marginal benefit and a marginal cost um, if I would like. And so uh, the marginal benefit for um, the certain amount of effort, if you take the derivative of that thing, so this is just uh, the derivative of the yield thing with respect to the effort, and that marginal benefit curve is just going to be QK 
minus q squared k over r times e um, with a two in front. And the marginal cost for the effort is just going to kind of be like the oil case, just a constant C. So we've got our total benefit. These are our total benefit and cost. And then we've got our marginals. And for the books case, Um, then uh, this just becomes 10 minus 2e. And um, and I don't, I forget what, the, I think the book uses a cost of two. So I think in the book's case, I think they use a cost of two. All right, so um, we've got total benefits and marginal benefits. And so now we can do our economic analysis, just like, you know, we've been doing. And so if I plot these things, then um, I am going to go ahead and plot the total benefit, even though we don't normally do that. But we'll see why I do that here in a second. So maybe I'll do that here. And this here is gonna be uh, just benefit. Um, these will be in, in units of dollars. And then down here, I'll plot the marginals. And so both of these are going to be in terms of effort. But here, I'm got the dollars per unit effort. And, um, and then up here, I've got uh, so that this one's in absolute dollars, these are the totals, and these are the marginals. And so if I plot my totals, maybe I'll use this guy. Um, I'm going to use the books number here. So this is for a, a YE of 10E minus E squared. And so that is going to go to zero again at 10. So I'll put, put a 10 both here and there. And it will reach a maximum at five, which I'll put here and there. And so it will look something like a parabola. Let's see how well that turns out. That's not terrible. And, um, and so this, uh, parabola is my total benefit. Or, yeah, it's not my net benefit. It's my total benefit. The net benefit will be that minus the cost um, for effort E. And if we plot our costs as we should, is um, from a good economic analysis, then we've got a cost that as um, uh, I said, our cost is two. So I'm gonna say that cost is equal to two E. So if I go, um, I haven't really set the scale here. So I'm just gonna draw an arbitrary straight line. And we're gonna pretend that it's slope is two. So this is like the marginal cost is equal to two. Maybe I'll just write that. So this here is cost equal to two E. So that the slope here has got a marginal cost equal to two. And so the net, if I, we know from much earlier in the class, Paste in a second. We know that from earlier in the class, the maximum t 
total, the maximum net benefit is going to be at the point where the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. So that's the equimarginal principle. And so there is this point here where the instantaneous slope of the benefit curve, the marginal benefit is equal to or parallel to the slope of this, um, of this cost curve. And so this here is the max net benefit. And so this is where um, the yield minus cost is max. And so Y minus cost or total benefit minus total cost. It's maximized at that particular point. And that um, will be the, so the, if we were to draw that in terms of marginals, then I know that the marginal benefit, which is just the slope of this thing, that starts at some value up here. Um, and that would, it actually starts at 10. So I suppose I could write that in, it starts at 10. And then it plummets to zero by five where it reaches its maximum. So I'll just draw a line there. And then it keeps going. And so this here is the marginal benefit. It hits zero at five because that's where it's maximized. And it hits two. So if I were to draw the marginal cost, that should occur at somewhere around here. So I'm gonna just draw a straight line through there and say that that is going to be where we think two is. So right about there. And that is, this is the marginal cost curve equal to two. This is the marginal benefit curve equal to 10 minus 2e. And um, this is the point here where marginal cost, marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. And that is where the total, that's the best place to fish. You, that is your, this point right here um, is our E star. And so this is where a private fishery will be fished. So in the private fishery, you own the whole fishery. And so you put another boat out there. And every time you put another boat out there, you feel all of the cost of that boat. And so every time you put that extra boat out there, you know it's costing you another this many dollars per year. Another boat, it costs you this many dollars per year and so on. But as you're putting a boat out there, then you're also noticing that the yield coming back to you is getting higher. So after one boat, it gets to here, after two boats, it gets to here, after three boats, it gets to here and goes you know, further on and on. And so what you're, you're feeling is the marginal benefit here. So after one boat, you, know, you get 10 fish per year, after one boat or 10 million fish per year, or 10,000, whatever the units are here, if you get a lot of fish per year after one boat, uh, after two boats, you don't get as many fish. After three boats, you don't get as many fish. After four boats, not as so many. Eventually, you put so many boats out there that the benefit you get in dollars from selling those fish will end up balancing out perfectly with the cost of how much it costs to maintain putting that boat out there for another year. And that's where you stop putting more boats out there because any other boat the cost of the boat will be more expensive than the benefit you get from the fish that you sell to the market. So that's where a private owner is going to be. Now, the problem with a lot of fisheries is that they're not private. And so, and 
and so just and also just as a reminder uh, remember here this five this here is the maximum sustainable yield and so um, this is economically efficient and anything that is to the right of this line is biologically overfished. So we are not even fishing at the maximum rate we could, but the little bit of benefit we get at fishing at the maximum rate we could uh, to be sustainable actually doesn't really balance out the costs of the boats. So the economically efficient solution is not only maximizing my private revenue, but it's even providing me a margin of safety is that I am not even fishing right on the edge. I am actually putting distance between me and the tipping point because it costs me something to put these boats out there. But the problem with fisheries, as we've kind of talked about in an earlier unit, is that fisheries um, can sometimes be open access. And so you could say, what about open access fisheries? And in an open access fishery, the problem is that the people entering the fishery only are paying the cost for their boat they're not paying the cost for every boat. And so really what their decision is, is, is are there still enough fish, is there still enough yield in that fishery for me to justify um, the cost of entering the fishery, just entering the fishery? So um, it's not an allocation decision, it's the um, should I enter a fishery. And so the, the, there's nobody preventing you from entering the fishery, so you can. So, so long as the yield experienced by the group is greater than the cost experienced by the group, then the group will enter. And so you find that the open access case, things equilibrate not at the efficient level, but at this level much higher than that, the open access level up here. So at EOA, this occurs where the total benefit is equal to the total cost, not the marginal. And so the open access equilibrium is much higher. It almost looks like it's double the, um, the equilibrium where the economic efficiency is. And um, in fact, if you <clears throat> solve for this, we find that the open access equilibrium in this case is equal to double the efficient equilibrium for this case. So it's much more fishing effort. And the problem here is that it, in this particular case, it is biologically overfished. So it is in this region, the open access fishery is in this region of biological overfishing. And so if you just leave the open access fishery open, people will come and come and come because they can get a yield, but that yield will gradually cause the fishery to decline in population, decline in population, decline in population, eventually um, go, go extinct. And so on a short term, it will look like the fishery is providing, the open access fishery is providing everyone with as much fish as they want, but in the long term, uh, the fish population will collapse and no one will be able to use the fishery again. So it's one of these collective ac action problems where um, you need to decide who gets access to the fishery. And in a self-organized way, it's difficult for a bunch of people to decide that I am willing to forego that fishery to allow you to fish in it. Because why are you getting the benefits if I can still get a little bit of benefit from joining? So because there is some benefit from joining the fishery, this joining process goes on 
until the total benefit from the fishery matches out at the total cost. And that is going to be higher than the efficient allocation. And in most cases, it will be in the biologically overfished region where it is above the maximum sustainable yield. Or you're going to be requesting more fish than the fish can, can, can support. So there are questions about that, about this basic analysis of the fishery, is that the fishery has this hump-shaped uh, yield curve, and that hump-shaped yield curve is what generates this problem where um, if it's privately owned, you get um, efficient solutions, and if it is publicly available, then you get inefficient solutions. And I might point out to those that uh, were paying attention here that if putting boats in the fishery were free, um, then in the efficient case, the cost curve would be flat, which would correspond to fishing just at the maximum sustainable yield. So even when boats are free, if it's a privately owned fishery, the privately owned fishery will maintain a sustainable population. But if boats are free, then the open access equilibrium will be down here where you put as much effort in as possible where to the point where the yield goes to zero. This is a, like the rush hour traffic case where eventually you get so many people on uh, the freeway that the freeway travels at zero miles per hour. So you can view this as almost like the speed of uh, a highway. Um, if one person, if one company is putting cars on the highway, then they will stop um, at the point where they maximize the benefits um, relative to congestion. But if everybody's free to put their cars on the highway, then they um, will end up uh, putting a congested case where you end up getting um, less yield than you would if only one person were in charge. So questions about that. No, okay. This is kind of a, a, just a review of our collective action problems. Collective action, not together. All right, so that is another example of renewable resources and the kind of an economic way of thinking about um, these renewable resources. And um, the there, and I should mention that there are ways to mitigate these challenges um, without a saying that only one person gets access to every fishery. And so one solution that the book um, discusses is turning an open access fishery into a common property fishery. And so this basically would mean it's, it turns it almost into uh, kind of like a club good that we kind of talked about before where you get a small set, and I emphasize small set of um, stakeholders or individuals get access to fishery. and no more. And so you could imagine that you charge for inclusion in this group. Now, this group itself uh, may not reach, it's possible that this uh, may not achieve economic efficiency because there are still negative externalities. There, my fishing takes regeneration rate away from you. And so um, if you and I are in this group together, I'm still putting an externality on you. And so because I'm not accounting for the costs of my fishing on you, we can expect that we might not reach efficiency. But if there's only a few of us that are causing these costs, and if we all know each other, then I might worry that there are social conventions that actually end up internalizing the costs I put on you. 
I might not fish as much today because I know that'll make you so upset that you might, um, you know, there might be some penalty. You might end up pointing out that I fished too much and you point it out to the group and I might get kicked out of the group or I might be charged a fine or you might just not like me anymore and we might not be friends anymore. And so there are reasons why keeping small groups ends up setting up social institutions. So the small groups, they um, reduce the size of negative externalities and they um, make it practical for social institutions and even um, <clears throat> and even group governance to internalize externalities. And you don't, um, and there's a question in the chat and I'll get to that in just a second. And you, you don't have to actually get all the way to economic efficiency, but the goal is to avoid biological overfishing. And so you might still be um, inefficient in an economic sense, but so long as the common property equilibrium is much closer to social efficiency, then there's a much higher probability it will not be biologically overfished. And so that's what we're kind of trying to get to here. The other solution to this um, is, you know, the second solution um, is you can just, you know, charge people per fish. So, you know, license fees, for example. And so if you have some way, and that's that becomes another thing, how do you actually implement this thing? That can be very costly and impractical. But if you have some way for someone that, anybody can enter your fishery, but when they exit the fishery, somebody counts how many fish they, uh, they, um, they got and then bills them for that. Or if they have a fishing license where they're only allowed to get up to two fish, and if you get caught doing uh, more than two fish, then you get heavy fines. Then that's another way to internalize these costs. And so that will tend to shift the fishing back towards social efficiency. All right, so there's a question, how do we make sure that we avoid inequity while trying to conserve the resource? That's a really interesting question. Like I know what price barriers um, uh, mean to, they mean little to wealthier people, but a lot to those in the socioeconomic, lower socioeconomic class and can stratify beneficial resources? Excellent question, that's a perfect question. And this even goes back to like, what social welfare function do we choose? Um, it's, it's, it's kind of related to that. If we just um, you know, charge everyone the same amount per fish, then it will be the case that you know, if we're charging per fish, that somebody who's rich is going to be able to get a larger access to fish than somebody who's poor. Um, if, um, and that's why you might say that, well, maybe everybody out there gets two fish and it doesn't matter how much money they have. Everybody out there can buy one license and that one license costs a certain amount and that certain amount gives you two fish and that's all you get for, for that season is two fish. Maybe that will be something that as long as the price is sufficiently low, that um, will end up um, you know, equalizing these things uh, a bit. But you know, there, there are still games that kind of have to be played with that. Um, this idea of equitable, you know, how do we create policies that promote equality? So equity is like inequality generated by bad policy. So inequity is inequality generated by bad policy. So how do we achieve equity? That's a really hard problem. Um, However we do it, if we want to try to achieve social efficiency, we want to do it in a way that we internalize costs, but it might just be that certain people have more of the cost paid than others. And so um, that might be the way we end up reallocating things so that you get more use by those who can't pay the costs and less use by those by do paying the cost. That might be one way to do that. But um, 
the other way to do it, the kind of more, uh, I don't know, the, the, the more hands-off way to do it is you just say that, well, those that, um, those that can't afford it, I guess they got to get their food some other way. And you let the market allocate food and you know you as I meant that the market allocate as the market allocates and those who can afford things get things and those who can't do not and um and for some people that might be the allocation that they view as a good one but it's a subjective choice that's why I think it kind of gets back to choosing your social welfare functions is that um the way the the economic efficiency we're maximizing here, this kind of Pareto efficiency between consumers and producers doesn't really speak that much to equity. And so um, we may need to add in additional constraints to try to come to equity, but, um, but those constraints, I don't have like a mathematical way to tell you these are the right constraints. We can add constraints in, but the choice of the constraints is totally subjective. And that's like a public policy course to decide like which constraints to use. So I don't know if that is a satisfying answer, but I hope that at least points you in the right direction. Okay. Okay, great. So um, that gets me to where I wanted us to be at the end of the last lecture. So um, uh, we have five minutes left. And so I, I just wanna at least give a preview of what is to come. And so, um, so the, the next lecture, which will be the last new content lecture, um, will be a brief survey um, of the basic ideas of market-based uh, um, environmental policy. And we are primarily, I wanna make sure that we uh, have the ability to focus on the difference, which I've already mentioned before, um, between uh, Pigou and Kos. And these have become kind of icons for two ways of thinking about achieving um, the reduction of negative externalities. So achieving efficiency um, by or completing markets. And we're gonna see that um, Pigou um, takes a very kind of government <clears throat> assisted approach. And so this is where we get things like emissions taxes. And then COAST um, it takes a much more individual approach. And in this case, all you have to do is to make sure the government um, provides property rights or enforces property rights. And so long as you can assume that property rights are there, then individuals will bargain to reduce the effect of negative externalities. And, um, and then the more recent um, case, uh, more recent economic cases, when we think about uh, you know, sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide and all that, and we talk about things like cap and trade, then what we're going to see is that cap and trade, we're going to finally introduce cap and trade. This is a Pigouvian approach to Kosian bargaining. So <clears throat> what we're going to see in cap and trade is that the government will end up producing a cap on emissions and will, in doing so, create a market where you introduce a new type of property. And that property will be your right to pollute. And people will be able to bargain to trade people's right to pollute individually. And that will cause some people to be able to pollute more and others less without the government actually deciding who's polluting and who's not polluting. And so in some ways, cap and trade, I mean, if you were actually to dig up uh, Coast, Ronald Coast or whatever, and ask him, then he would hate um, you know, cap and trade. But practically, 
Um, you know, so cap and trade really is a Pigouvian approach. And we will, again, next time we will define what I mean by Pigouvian and Cozian and all that sort of stuff. But um, just as a preview to that, what we're building to and what I want, I want to make sure you leave this course with is an understanding of this more modern market-based approach to emissions control of cap and trade when it works and when it doesn't work. And what we see is that cap and trade is a Pigouvian approach, but it is strongly inspired by the individual-based bargaining that is really appealing to those that like the Cozian approach of keeping government out. So um, government is in, with cap and trade, but it is in, in a kind of mediating way that allows people to trade, which makes it um, both kind of share elements of both of these. And that's what we'll get to um, next time. So I feel like that is a good uh, place to stop. So let's do an attendance question. So the attendance question is, I feel like I should do one of these in the middle of the lecture again uh, next time. Um, so the attendance question URL is in the chat, and I guess the question I'm going to ask is, um, is it possible to biologically overfish at the economically efficient equilibrium for a privately owned fishery? So that's my question there is that, uh, so the question is if we just let economics rule, um, are we gonna be safe? So does economics alone prevent biological overfishing or do we need additional regulation in order to prevent biological overfishing when the fishery is privately owned? That's my question. And that's all I've got for you today. And so uh, if you have questions, happy to stick around for them. If you don't, um, I hope you have a good weekend and we'll have our last new content-based lecture on Tuesday, then Thanksgiving, and then the Tuesday after that, we'll do a review for the final and then the final. So any questions? No, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Yep, you too. I just have a quick question that's regarding what, what you said about the attendance question. You said, you mentioned uh -huh. before, like, um, if you, how do you say it? At the at the maximum, at the curve, if you go to the right, is it, it'll be a bio overfished if it was open um, open access. But if it was, if, but right. if it was a private good, it, you, it's possible just to overfish, right? <clears throat> well, the, so the, um, so the, the idea is that uh, if, if it's privately owned and you're internalizing all of the costs uh, and all of the benefits yourself, then, um, then the question is, will you ever have a tendency to overfish? And so, um, and so in the lecture, we talked about how the, the, the benefits and costs kind of take care of themselves and that um, overfishing is, was kind of a, would be an economically weird thing to do. And so without just, saying the attendance question uh, answer, uh, you know, here, um, uh, I'm just kind of hinting at it, that if you go back and look at that slide, then um, we see that for the private one, that's the E star. And you, um, if you take the cost down to zero, you can see the worst you can do. And so if you take that cost curve and make it horizontal uh, and um, then see where in that, that that, that means that the, that the yield effort curve is gonna to come to equilibrium at the top of the curve. And so the really question is that's the worst you can do. The top of the yield effort curve is that biological overfishing. That's kind of the question. Okay. Anything else? All right, well, have a good weekend all.